Hello, European history students, and welcome to today's lecture, which is all about events leading to World War II. It's really kind of a two-parter. At first, we'll talk about the Spanish Civil War as a dress rehearsal for World War II, and then I'll talk about the moves of Hitler and Nazi Germany uh, in the 1930s, moving us to war, which starts in 1939. I'm going to call this Hitler's War because I really believe that uh, World War II would not have happened in the same way that it did without Hitler and his, uh, his ideas and philosophies. First, we need to talk, as I said, about the Spanish Civil War. It is, uh, as I said, a kind of uh, practice or dress rehearsal for World War II. It starts off with the move from a monarchy to a republic in 1931. And uh, the republic, like any republic, was beset by political factions and some political infighting, a kind of left-right split that would remind you of the situation in France was happening in Spain at this point in time. Uh, it is a democratic republic, and so you know different kinds of groups were voting for different kinds of people. In 1936, this is during, of course, the Great Depression, which doesn't really affect Spain too much because it's not a completely industrialized country. But in 1936, the elections were won by a popular front coalition. This, once again, is, is what you see happening in France around this point in time. This leftist, coalition of republicans and socialists and anarchists and communists came into power with the intent of trying to help people out who were you know uh, lower class people or working class people and um, of course you had others who were opposed to that kind of thing people from the right and uh, the right then reacts in a uh, in a very extreme way the right is basically afraid that uh, land will be seized, that uh, factories will be taken over and, uh, and nationalized and that sort of thing. The uh, person who uh, around who the rightists coalesce is a, uh, a general by the name of Francisco Franco. He is um, stationed in Morocco with a bunch of his troops right across uh, the Straits of Gibraltar from Spain. And he wants to uh, put all of the right-wing people together. He has uh, nationalists and Spanish fascists called phalangists, and then those politically religious Catholics as well on his side. And he invades Spain with the troops from Morocco. He is assisted in getting his troops across the Straits of Gibraltar by the Germans who uh, loan Francisco Franco transport planes, airplanes, and uh, fly his troops into uh, the Iberian Peninsula. It then becomes a war. Uh, the two different sides are the nationalist side or the right side versus Republicans, the left side, that coalition that I just talked about in the last slide. And like many civil wars, this one uh, becomes very personal and um, a lot of atrocities occur both on the left and on the right. You can see there a, a the skeleton of a nun. Religious um, clergy are, uh, are are horribly brutalized and and um, and killed and so on by people on the left, and uh, of course people on the left who fall into the hands of uh, of right wing people are likewise tortured and murdered and so on. It's a very um, it's a very kind of personal fight and and really quite nasty, kind of like the Russian Civil War where you had leftists and rightists fighting against each other. The international response to a war breaking out in Europe, the first one that we've seen since World War I, was to try to uh, isolate uh, Spain from the rest of the continent so that this war wouldn't spread to other places. Um, Britain and France and the United States officially stayed out of this conflict. And the British even thought if no one was providing arms to either side in Spain that uh, this would peter out very quickly. And so the French and the British put an arms embargo upon both sides in, uh, in the Spanish Civil War. Germany and Italy as right-wing states, far right-wing states, of course, supported the nationalists under Franco. And Stalin's Soviet Union decided to support the communists, who were part of the Republican coalition, but then also wanted to uh, to have the communists, of course, lead the charge uh, and, 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 and turn Spain basically into a communist country eventually. 
Thousands of people who were opposed to fascism, uh, including Americans and British people and French people and so on, volunteer to fight on the leftist side in Spain. And, um, and, and as I say, this becomes a really a kind of ideological fight between the left and the right in, uh, in Spain that you'll, you'll see later on, at least on the Eastern Front in, uh, in World War II. Equipment and tactics from um, this period of time were being tested by, uh, by both sides, really. The Germans are providing a lot of aid to Franco and, and, uh, and his side, including, as I said, airplanes. There's this Condor Legion that the Germans provide to, um, to assist the nationalist side. The uh, probably most notorious thing that they do is test out new battle tactics or new terror tactics and uh, attack um, cities from the air and try to uh, try to destroy people's morale doing that. The Spanish city of Guernica is um, is is a left wing stronghold or a uh, Republican stronghold, and so the Condor Legion attacks this city. And Pablo Picasso, the Spanish artist, paints this in a very famous uh, in a very famous piece, which you'll see in here in just a second. We'll talk a little bit more about art uh, in uh, in the coming weeks, the more modern art or 20th century art, including Cubism, which um, Picasso is mostly known for. But this bombing of Guernica is, as I say, a, a kind of dress rehearsal for World War II. You'll see large scale bombings of cities by both sides during World War II. And it's really just to try to um, force the enemy to surrender and to break their morale and so on does really, though, uh, end up killing a lot of innocent people, and it's really one of the atrocities of, of, of war. Here we can see, hopefully this will move for us. If not, we'll just move on. But here we can see the situation. Yeah, it doesn't look like it's going to work. Usually this, uh, this starts to move, and you can kind of see the, um, the yellow side or the nationalist side take over. I won't mess with it. Uh, just know that in the end, um, what was a Republican country gets taken over by the nationalists. The nationalists end up winning the Spanish Civil War, as I say, with help from uh, Nazi Germany and with about 50,000 volunteers from fascist Italy as well. So in 1939, the nationalists win and the dictatorship that is created under Francisco Franco, a right wing, almost fascist dictatorship, lasts really until his death in the 1970s. So Spain uh, avoids World War II, recovering from their own Spanish Civil War, and then um, a kind of outcast as a right-wing regime all the way until the 1970s. Moving on from the Spanish Civil War to really talk about Hitler's war or the, the lead up to World War II, it really does go back to Hitler and Hitler's goals set forth in his book Mein Kampf. Really what he wanted to do was to revise the Treaty of Versailles in a number of different ways. For example, he wanted to break the uh, the armaments clause of, of the Treaty of Versailles. He wanted to rearm Germany. In fact, he wanted to create uh, a Germany that had the most powerful army in Europe. He also wanted to undo the borders that had been, uh, been put into place with the Treaty of Versailles, cutting off a whole lot of Germans from uh, from Germany, so he wants to bring all of the ethnic Germans home to the Reich. Of course, this is that, that problem that we always talk about uh, in class this semester, which is irredentism. And then going beyond that in a kind of sick and twisted dream called uh, Lebensraum, or living space, Hitler intends on taking over Central Europe and Eastern Europe and um, repopulating Eastern Europe with what he calls Aryan people or German people and doing away with first enslaving and then eventually doing away with the ethnic um, Slavic people and Jewish people who live there. So the Nazis, once again, are legally put into power in January of 1933. Soon thereafter, there is the Reichstag fire, which was pinned on the communists. And, uh, and then the rest of 1933 really isn't very active for the Germans or for the Nazis on the international stage. They do pull Germany out of the League of Nations. You can probably um, come up with the reason for that. As I told you before, the League of Nations is really kind of a uh, an organization that is to prevent war through negotiation. Hitler wants to eventually have a war, and he doesn't really want to negotiate unless it's just a kind of trick that he's using to uh, to gain whatever it is that he wants. 
Meanwhile, in 1933, um, internally, the, the Nazis are busy coordinating German society, that is to say, Nazifying German society and uh, taking out all of the enemies of the Nazis. 1934 is, is an interesting year. The Nazis are um, not very powerful yet, and the German army is um, is really once again, not um, not anything to to, uh, to speak of. In 1934, something interesting happened in Austria, the state just to the south of Germany, and a, and a German state as well, just not part of Germany. There are Nazis who are part of um, of the Austrian political scene, and uh, these Nazis were uh, interested in overthrowing the the current regime in Austria and um, and joining Germany. Well, they uh, assassinated the leader of, uh, of Austria, a, an Austro-fascist by the name of Engelbert Dollfuss, and, um, and then tried to have a putsch or had to had, have an overthrow of the government, seize power, and then once again join Germany. Well, when this happens, when Engelbert Dollfuss is assassinated, Mussolini rushes to the aid of the Austrians. At this point in time, Mussolini is uh, arguably more powerful than Hitler and Italy with an army and Germany without an army is, is more powerful. And so Mussolini actually threatens Hitler and threatens the Germans with war if the Germans try to intervene in, uh, in Austria and, uh, and, and take it over. And so Hitler and, and the Germans back down in 1934, which once again is, is kind of uh, interesting in light of what happens later in the power relationship between the Germans and the Italians. In 1935, uh, there was a plebiscite or a yes-no vote in a part of Germany, the Saarland, which had been um, given to France to, to mine or to use economically after World War I. The question for the people of the Saar was, did they want to remain under French control? Did they want to become independent or did they want to join Nazi Germany? And the plebiscite was... Uh, I guess it's a yes, no for all of those things. Um, but the plebiscite was very much in favor of joining Nazi Germany. So there's quite a bit of nationalism in the Saarland. Even though the Hitler regime is far right wing, it seemed like the people, people of the Saarland wanted to, uh, wanted to join Germany. My dog, uh, participated in the lecture as well. In 1935 as well, uh, Hitler repudiates or um, simply does away with the Treaty of Versailles disarmament clauses. He announces that Nazi Germany is going to rearm and they just don't really care what the rest of the world thinks. I might remind you that the Weimar Republic had secretly um, undergone a uh, testing of, of various kinds of weapons and so on, illegal weapons, even before the Nazis took power. But this is an open, um, aggressive kind of challenge to the Treaty of Versailles. And the French uh, want to do something about it, just like, like they had done something when the Germans stopped paying reparations in 1923. Uh, the British, though, are not interested in having another world war to keep a nation from having a military or defending itself. And so they tell the French to settle down and nothing happens. In 1936, Hitler cranks up uh, even more aggression by violating the Treaty of Versailles and reoccupying the Rhineland with German soldiers. You might remember that the Rhineland, the strip of territory uh, which borders France, was supposed to never have German soldiers in it again. It was occupied for a period of time after World War I. So by sending troops into the Rhineland, Hitler is violating both the Treaty of Versailles and also the Treaty of Locarno after World War I, uh, which had been signed kind of trying to keep the peace. The German generals who um, Hitler forces to march into the Rhineland are really afraid that Hitler has overstepped himself here and that the French will react, that they will invade. And since the Germans really don't have an army to speak of, they're going to lose World War II really before it even happens. The French look to the British once again and say, uh, look what the Germans are up to. We need to act now. We need to invade the Rhineland. We need to put put the Germans back in their place. We need to keep them um, you know, under, the, under control for, with the Treaty of Versailles. 
And the British once again kind of shrug and say, no, we really uh, don't really want to have a war, even though we'll probably be successful. We don't want to have a war breakout over Germans occupying Germany that just didn't make any sense to them. And so Hitler uh, is viewed by German people and by the generals who were afraid as really kind of uh, uh, correct or a uh, kind of genius and, and really quite gutsy and they start to believe in him and uh, and people really start to uh, to follow him quite a bit. At this point in time too, Mussolini's attitude towards Hitler becomes much more friendly. He looks at what Hitler's up to, realizes of course that they're ideologically very similar as both having fascist states and a treaty is signed between uh, Nazi Germany and fascist Italy called the Rome-Berlin Axis. Here's a map. You can see uh, Germany at this point in time, and then that sort of, um, I'm not sure what, what you would call that color, salmon color, is the Rhineland, which was uh, taken by, by the Germans or reoccupied by the Germans in 36. You can see Austria is that purple-ish color uh, to the south, and then there's this other territory known as the Sudetenland as part of Czechoslovakia, which I'll talk about uh, here in just a second. pictures of Germans uh, marching into the Rhineland. Once again, you can see it's just a bunch of infantry soldiers with rifles, and this really would have been the time for the French and or the British or anyone else to attack the Germans and put, put them in their place and overthrow Hitler. Could have saved the world a lot of pain and, and problems. In 1938, uh, we have a really uh, a critical year of Hitler gathering Germans or Hitler um, over uh, overcoming the irredentism that uh, that he hated so much. In uh, early in 1938, the new chancellor of Austria, a guy by the name of Schuschnigg, is invited to uh, to visit Germany to discuss the uh, the Austrian problem, let's say. And um, Schuschnigg is brought to, uh, to, to Hitler's eagle's nest and Hitler spends hours screaming at him about how Austria, his birthplace, should be part of Germany. And uh, Schuschnigg is really quite concerned that he's never going to make it home alive. He eventually does go back to, uh, to Austria. And when he gets to Austria, he uh, he announces on the radio that he would like to have a plebiscite that asks the Austrian people whether they want an Anschluss or not, whether they want to join Nazi Germany or not. He's probably thinking that a plebiscite under his government is going to um, be able to be a, a strong no against having an Anschluss. When the Germans hear, when Hitler hears that uh, Schuschnigg has, has ordered this plebiscite, they decide to invade Austria. Uh, as I say, this happens in March of 1938. The Germans roll across the border and there is very little resistance. In fact, there's really only resistance in one city in, in Austria at this point in time. The vast majority of Austrians cheered Nazi Germany taking over Austria, this so-called Anschluss, because, you know, once again, there is uh, irredentism going on. Austrians are essentially German people, many of whom didn't want to be part of a small state after World War I. They wanted to be part of Großdeutschland or Greater Germany. Of course, there were a, a whole number of people, too, who were opponents of the Nazis, you know, socialists or communists, um, Jewish people and so on, who the Nazis were going to persecute, and they were mortified that their country is being taken over by uh, by the Nazis. But um, you know, the vast majority of, of Austrians were for it, no matter what you might have seen in uh, in the movie The Sound of Music. Once Austria is taken as a part of the Greater German Reich, the Nazis then start trouble over the Germans who live in Czechoslovakia, the so-called Sudeten Germans. There are three million ethnic Germans who live in Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia, if you remember, is a very strong country. It's a democratic country. It's a country that is allied with France. And so it seems unlikely at this point in time that uh, Hitler and the Nazis will be able to take over Czechoslovakia or take the um, take the territory where these Germans in Czechoslovakia are living. Uh, Hitler, though, is threatening war if he doesn't get these Sudeten Germans as a part of his Reich. And so all of Europe is concerned uh, about this. And, and they're wondering if Hitler is bluffing, if he's really willing to go to war over these three million Germans or not. Here you have some images of the Anschluss 
where you have uh, German soldiers uh, and, um, and Austrian soldiers together. Looks like uh, in that bottom photo, they're having a good time together, lifting the barrier between Austria and, and Germany. And you can see two people uh, lined, giving the fascist salute on the right in that, uh, in that upper image. Here's a map with the Sudetenland. Once again, it's this area which used to be part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, filled with German people. And uh, it's also part, um, it's also very mountainous there. And um, it's, it's really the, the part of Czechoslovakia that has a lot of fortifications that would be able to defend against a German invasion. Well, with the possibility of war coming, it was decided that negotiations should take place. This happens in September of 1938, and it happens in Munich in Germany. The British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain, the French leader Hitler and Mussolini all show up in Munich and they discuss this problem of the Sudeten Germans and Czechoslovakia. The Czechs were not invited to sit at the table and the Soviets were not invited to sit at the table. The Czechs, this is really quite sad, uh, this obviously uh, has everything to do with their, their, uh, their existence and yet they aren't uh, invited to participate in these negotiations. And the Soviets are, you know, controlled by Stalin. And so Western allies just don't feel like, uh, like that's the kind of person that they want also negotiating over this. Well, the Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain of Britain agrees to uh, allow the Germans to take the Sudetenland, to get those three million Germans and move the borders of Czechoslovakia. He believes that by negotiating with Hitler, that Hitler is a normal politician, let's say, he believes that he's secured and he says this peace in our time at the Munich conference. Uh, he views this uh, Sudeten question as, you know, simply ethnic Germans wanting to belong to Germany. And so it's a question of national self-determination that wasn't resolved at the end of World War I or was resolved unfairly at the end of World War I. So Germans joining Germany doesn't seem like that big of a deal. Hitler, of course, promises that this is all that he wants. He has no more demands after this. Here are Hitler and Neville Chamberlain shaking hands and looking friendly towards each other. And there is Neville Chamberlain after having flown back to Britain and holding up a peace treaty or a treaty that was signed by Hitler, and, uh, declaring that there will be no war and everything's gonna be great from here on out. Well, uh, it doesn't quite work out that way. The Slovakian part of Czechoslovakia felt like it was um, the junior partner in this Czechoslovakian um, country and didn't want to be under the control, let's say, of Czechs anymore. They figured since part of, uh, of Czechoslovakia was already being changed that they could break up with the rest of, uh, of the Czech part. And so Slovakia asks for independence and uh, and breaks away from from the Czech lands of, Borav uh, of Bohemia and Moravia. Other nations then surrounding Czechoslovakia also make some demands on Czech territory. And this gives Hitler the pretext to invade the Czech part of Czechoslovakia, Bohemia and Moravia, in order to protect Slovakia, which is just nonsense. It's just a pretext. Slovakia becomes an allied state to Nazi Germany and Bohemian Moravia filled with Czech people becomes a kind of slave state of, uh, of the Nazis and of Nazi Germany. You can see it's called the, uh, protect, uh, the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia, but essentially it is just a conquest. It's very unlike what, you had, ha what had happened in Austria where the, the people of Austria were willing to go and, and become a part of, uh, of Nazi Germany. The Czechs do not want to be part of Nazi Germany and they are treated really quite poorly. Hitler is uh, once again gutsy and once again right. He was gambling that, uh, that, that a war could break out. He said he was willing to go to war over Czechoslovakia, over the Sudeten Germans. And, uh, and the generals who ran the army were really quite frightened that Hitler would order them to attack, attack Czechoslovakia or that they would get involved in a war at this point in time. 
And now that Hitler was right, now that he's gutsy, now that he's getting not only the three million Sudeten Germans, but now he has ordered and, and has been successful in conquering the rest of the Czech part of Czechoslovakia. German generals are impressed. The German people are impressed. And, uh, and the French and the British are absolutely outraged. Neville Chamberlain looks like an idiot because he trusted Hitler. And both France and Britain vow to never again be hoodwinked or tricked by Hitler. They go and sign treaties uh, with Poland and Romania and Greece. This time the British are involved in signing treaties with Poland, Romania and Greece and uh, you know, guarantee their territorial integrity and guarantee that they're, they'll basically go to war if Hitler is, uh, is naughty again or if Hitler has aspirations of taking over any of those countries. Now, it would have been nice if France and Britain could have kind of um, remade an alliance from World War I and included Russia, but uh, Russia is no longer Russia. Russia is the Soviet Union. It's controlled by a far left wing dictator, a communist dictator, and the capitalist democracies of the West are not interested in becoming allied with a, uh, a murderous dictator like Stalin. So they simply can't bring themselves to sign an alliance with Stalin and keep Hitler in check with the, with the threat of a two front war. Meanwhile, the craziest thing happens in August of 1939. The Soviet Union and Nazi Germany sign a treaty. They sign a mutual non-aggression pact, which is uh, really quite amazing. It, it shocks the world because these are two diametrically opposed political philosophies. You have the alleged communism of, of the Soviet Union and, you, and you know, being a, a far left wing for the people, allegedly, kind of state versus the right-wing hyper-nationalism of Nazi Germany. Everyone thought that this kind of alliance would be impossible, but here it is. And here's also a cartoon that shows you the Nazi-Soviet pact or the, um, the Molotov-Ribbentrop pact, as it's oftentimes called, too. Stalin on the left, Hitler on the right, um, looking at, uh, at taking over Eastern Europe, having their frontiers uh, together. This is eventually what happens uh, as a mutual non-aggression pact has some secret clauses that divide Poland and Eastern Europe between the Nazis and the Soviets as well. And you can see too that each one is armed and is really just kind of waiting for the chance to shoot the other. Well, with that mutual non-aggression pact uh, in his portfolio. Hitler starts in with the same old story. There are German people who are in Poland, Germans who are being abused by the Poles, allegedly, it's nonsense, and that Germans belong in Germany. And so he demands the Polish corridor, he demands territory on the border of Germany and Poland. He wants to link uh, East Prussia with the rest of Germany and uh, and demands that this territory be given to him or else once again he is willing to go to war and the big question is then leading up to this is will the allies help the poles will the french will the british um, attack germany if germany attacks poland now hitler believes that western democracies are weak they don't want war he does want war it's part of his philosophy and so he doubts that the French and the British are actually going to help the Poles when he does attack. And even if they do help Poland, he's willing to risk a war at this point in time. And this is really how World War II starts. You can see uh, East Prussia there as a kind of island of, of territory within Poland. This is the territory, including Danzig, that uh, that yellow part there, that Hitler Hitler wants to link with the rest of Germany, this territory in between. Um, in between East Prussia and Pomerania there. So going back to what I entitled uh, th this lecture um, as a kind of subtitle, Hitler's War, you can look at Mein Kampf and, uh, and realize that Hitler planned this war of aggression in Eastern Europe from the 1920s when he wrote Mein Kampf. Really everything that he was doing in the 1930s once he took power was a kind of step-by-step -step process to get to his ultimate goal. Um, things happened. There were different kinds of opportunities like um, the plebiscite in Austria or um, you know, Slovakia wanting to break away from the Czech part of Czechoslovakia and so on. 
different opportunities, different situations changed the pace of his steps, yet Hitler was always working towards his Lebensraum plans, his plans to seize territory in Eastern Europe, uh, murder the people there, enslave and murder the people there, and then replace them with what he would call Aryans or good Germans. He's trying to create in the end a thousand year Reich and, uh, and have a, a kind of Nazi Germany, which dominates the rest of the world. In some ways, it's kind of like Germany's place in the sun from World War I, but just on steroids. We'll talk about the war uh, with the next lecture. Hope you enjoyed it.